Welcome back to the goofiest Gorsh. that was The Lord of the Rings, the animated movie from 1978. In the first part of this series, I went through and talked about all the silliness that happened on the surface level of this movie. If you haven't seen the first part, what are you doing? Pause this video, go back and watch that first part if you want this video to make any sense. You good? Alright, let's move on. In this video, I want to dive a little deeper and talk about what was going on behind the scenes. Maybe this will help explain why the filmmakers went in the directions they did. Because if there's not a good reason for this, then there's no hope for humanity. In general, the film had really mixed reviews when it was released in 1978. A lot of people appreciated the whimsy it captured from Tolkien's books, there is an inn, a merry old inn. and to this day, die-hard Tolkien fans say this movie is more true to the books than Peter Jackson's trilogy. Nerd alert! But ultimately, people were disappointed that the film was incomplete and there wasn't any prospect of a part two. The film had a budget of $4 million. To put that in perspective, Disney's Robin Hood came out in 1973 and it had a budget of $5 million. And that movie looks pretty good. So like, you have to wonder where that $4 million was spent with The Lord of the Rings. Despite this, it was considered a box office success as it made $30.5 million and the production company was happy with how much it made. It's mine now and I shall keep it! But there were a lot of bumps in the road which resulted in the final product being, well, this. Up on the ridge! They're coming! Here they are! The film actually had a rather impressive cast, the most notable being John Hurt who played Aragorn, the same guy who played Garrick Ollivander in Harry Potter, and Anthony Daniels aka C-3PO who played Legolas. Believe it or not, Mick Jagger actually reached out to Bakshi wanting to play Frodo, but they declined his offer as the recordings had already been done. I think it would have been pretty amazing to have Mick Jagger voice Frodo. Like I don't think it would have been any good, but can you just imagine Mick Jagger as Frodo? Is this fun? Is this interesting? Is this, oh, this is boring. The director, Ralph Bakshi, fell in love with Tolkien's books and wanted to adapt them to film. He had a lot of issues getting the attention of production companies simply because something of this scope hadn't been attempted before. At the time, there were a lot of technical limitations with animation and there had never been scenes that included thousands and thousands of moving characters in the background, such as what would have been the case with an animated Lord of the Rings movie, which is a totally reasonable and fair problem in my opinion. Eventually the film was picked up, but after that it took a lot of time in the writer's room to get it right. Originally, Bakshi wanted to make three movies and the Hobbit prequel, but then they only wanted to do three movies, but they didn't know how a middle film would work without huh? a beginning and an end. Then they brought it down to two films, but for some reason only one ever came out. It's not really clear why this happened, but there was a lot of back and forth between Bakshi and the producers, and I think there was a lot of tension between Bakshi and the producer Saul Zanitz. The two didn't play very very nice together, and apparently after an argument those two had, Xanis refused to do part 2 and that was the end of it. As I mentioned in part 1, they used something called rotoscoping for the majority of the film. This way they could cut back on animation costs and just animate over live action, which is why the film looks the way it does. <laughs> Apparently, Bakshi was terrified of horses, but since most things were shot in live action, they needed real horses, and for those scenes, Bakshi had to direct from inside a caravan. Bill. Poor old Bill. Bakshi later stated that he regretted using the rotoscope in the way that he did, which was tracing the source footage rather than just using it as a guide. And he's right because, well, it looks pretty bad. In post-production, Bakshi was only given four weeks to cut the film together. So think about that. Nowadays, the average film spends six to 12 months in post. And back then, they didn't have any editing software. So you literally had to cut the film by hand and put it together. Then it has to be edited. 
You mean some of the film has to be cut out? Right. Some bits are thrown away. Quite a lot, in fact, because we filmed about three times more than we needed. He asked for an additional four months to work on the cut, but was denied. Denied. Bakshi said that working on the film was exhausting. Diehard Tolkien fans put a lot of pressure on him to do a good job, but he did find peace in meeting with Priscilla Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's daughter. Priscilla even stated that she loved the film after it came out. I remember that I had nightmares about the Black Riders. It was so powerful. <laughs> Bakshi always wanted to go back and make part two, but often regarded making part one as the worst experience of his life. He later admitted that the film wasn't as good as it should have been and remarked that an animated film couldn't do it justice. To him, it was just too complex for animation to handle. I don't want to stay here. We are going now, Pippin. On one hand, I feel bad for Bakshi. In a lot of ways, he was a pioneer of adapting a really complex piece of literature using technology that couldn't keep up. He loved Tolkien's books and only wanted to share his love of them on the big screen. He built it from the ground up and he treated the film like it was his baby. But on the other hand, because he was so passionate about this film, he became highly protective of his work and criticized adaptations that came after his. Allow me to explain the aftermath that occurred after the film was released. It's my own, my precious. He was approached by Warner Brothers to make the Two Towers live action movie, but he angrily refused because he wasn't initially notified when they made The Fellowship of the Ring. And after watching Peter Jackson's trilogy, he said he didn't understand it. He stated that he's glad that Peter Jackson had a film to look at, referring to his own film of course. He thinks that because of this, Jackson had a much easier time than he did. Bakshi also said his movie had more heart and that Jackson didn't understand Tolkien and created a special effects garbage to sell toys. Do not say that again. Bakshi later apologized for these remarks, but it shows you how jaded he became after his movie and after everything that happened during the production. Personally, I don't think the two adaptations should ever be compared because they're just not in the same boat. Despite this, however, Bakshi still made these comments about Jackson's films out of pure pettiness and spite, and I think that's unprofessional. Shall have such need of strength. Bakshi also complained that Jackson never acknowledged his film and resented him for this. In reality though, there's evidence that Jackson acknowledged his film as early as 1998, with The Fellowship of the Ring being released in 2001. In the DVD audio commentary, Jackson even credited Bakshi Bakshi's film as being a huge influence for his movies. Jackson thought the proud feet moment at Bilbo's birthday was brilliant with a low angle. On blowers and proud foot, proud feet. <laughs> proud foot. I think Bakshi's comments were really short sighted and unhelpful towards his ultimate goal, which was getting people excited about Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. I understand that he loved the books and wanted them to be represented as best as possible, but personally, after hearing Bakshi's comments about Jackson's adaptation, it makes me like Bakshi's adaptation a lot less. Regardless, I still do feel a little bad for Bakshi. He had a really traumatizing time making this film, and there were a lot of limitations that prevented him from making the film he envisioned. I can't imagine how frustrating that must have been. But when I think about Lord of the Rings, I'm going to think about Jackson's adaptations and the work that he and his team put into making them what they are. But frankly, we're lucky to have both adaptations. <laughs> So that was The Lord of the Rings, 1978. I really enjoyed making these videos, and I hope you enjoyed learning some things about a movie that maybe a lot of people have forgotten about. Did learning about the behind the scenes make you like the movie more or less? Let me know in the comments. There's actually another animated film, so maybe I'll talk about that in my next video. Anyways, thanks for watching. There is an inn, a merry old inn, beneath an old grey hill, and there they brew a beer so brown.